Welcome to another Ask GMB and Tech. Yep, out in the woods again. Got any questions? Send them right to us there or add them in the comments underneath. Use that hashtag, Ask GMB and Tech. First question this week, how do you remove rounded heads on a hex key bolt on the stem? Oh, okay, I feel your pain here. So you've over tightened it or you've slipped using maybe unlucky in an old Allen key that's a bit rounded on the edges. You've got a few options here. So the first option would be to use a rifled head Allen key. Now there's a few available on the market. I've got the park ones and the ends of them are actually rifled. And the idea is they're very slightly smaller than the head of the bolt and the tapers. So you can use those to get that head of the bolt out. Now that is one method. Another way you could try using a Torx head in there. If it's just a little bit messed up and your Allen key, say it's a four mil, isn't gripping, T25 might just give you a little bit more purchase. Other options would be to get rid of the head of the bolt. You could drill it off or you could cut it out and then have to remove the threaded part uh, or to use an easy out. So the first way of doing that, I guess, would be using a left hand drill bit and you'd screw it into that and that basically would hopefully unscrew it or an easy out. So an easy out basically is kind of like a left-handed drill bit. It's a very particular bit of kit. And you do a little pilot hole first with a tiny little drill bit. And then you'd screw in the easy out. And the same thing, it's left hand, so you would hopefully undo the thread. A little bit tricky, there's a few options there, but see if you can get hold of a, a rifle dialing key or see if you can get a Torx key in there. Of course, if you are gonna put a Torx key on there, make it an old one. Don't make it one that you actually use, like keep some old old keys for stuff like this when it happens. Um, good luck, take your time with that. Next one, what is your favorite tire? Wow, okay, so how long is a bit of string? This completely varies. So all time, I've always liked the Maxxis Ardent Race. Uh, we actually use Vittoria tires now, so the nearest I found to that is one of these that's on the back. This is the Agaro tire. Now, actually, it's a little bit more advanced than the Maxxis, this one has four compounds rather than three compounds in it. And the tread design's got staircases on it instead of ramps. So it rolls about the same speed as one of, uh, one of the Ardent Race tires, similar shoulder profile, but with the steps on it, you've actually got two more surfaces for when you're climbing. So even though it's a low stack height and they're quite close together knobs, there's a surprising amount of grip on it. And in fact, the fact that I've got it on my bike at this time of year tells you a lot because of the tire on the front, I've got a motor which is another one of my favorites. And that's basically a mud tire. So we've got a mud tire and something that's not good for mud at all, but actually works really well. Now, as you can see, it's got a very low stack height and the knobbles are very close together. So probably not the ideal tire for running at this time of year, you might be thinking, yeah, but the fact I've just put this on for this time of year for that exact reason, it doesn't hold on to mud and it can cut through to the stuff underneath. And up front, I'm running the complete opposite, I'm basically running a mud tire. So business up front, party out back, if you want to put it that way. Um, and it's kind of the same on all my bikes. I like a faster tire on the rear and a grippier tire on the front. On a cross-country bike at the moment, I'm running a Barzo on the front, Victoria, and on the rear running the Mezcal for the same reason. The Barzo is more open-spaced, cuts in better, better traction all around, but it's not quite as fast. Although it's better to run front and rear in wet weather, I prefer running the Mezcal on the rear because it's insanely fast. Um, I don't know, there's lots, there's lots of good tyres out there, to be fair. I always used to like some of the specialised tyres, so Storm Control was always a good tyre. Classic tyres, Michelin, Comp 16, way back in the day. Um, what a great tyre, later known as the DH16. Um, doesn't exist anymore. Too many good options out there. In fact, what do people like as their options? Do you like a set of tyres, um, as in the same tyre, front and rear, or do you like front and rear specific, or do you choose your own, like I do, having a fast roller on the rear and a grippier tire on the front. Interested to know that. Next tire. Tire. Next question. Tires on the brain. Um, ooh, would I rather be a pro XC racer or a pro DH racer? Interesting. Um, if you asked me the same question 10 years ago, I probably would have said pro DH racer, hands down. You look at what downhill racers do, it's, it's incredible. Um, but that's definitely much more of a young man's game these days. Nino Shirt has proven that even the older guys can still hack it in cross country, so I'd probably go that way. But on the cross country thing, I've got the utmost respect for all of our cross country athletes. And I think I use the word athletes with cross country because I think they are genuine athletes. I don't necessarily like that term used across sport. I see, I see things a bit differently, but cross country is probably the most demanding form of mountain biking. Absolute, you've got to be at your physical peak 
but you've also got to be able to ride a bike on very technical terrain when your heart rate is maxed and you're literally breathing, you know, you're breathing out your ass, you're breathing as hard as you can breathe. If you can do all of that and win races, I'm, I'm in absolute awe of the top men and women of what they can do on their bikes. And it's very different from what it used to be. People used to see it as an easy sport. Let me tell you, it's absolutely not. And some of the courses are so technical that even downhill racers are looking at them thinking, God, do you know what? It's pretty impressive what they can get down on those bikes with those tires and that sort of stuff. So yeah, pro cross country racer. I think they're the best. They're incredible, absolutely incredible. Uh, next question. With all you know, have you ever thought about getting into bike design and building your own bike? Quite often, actually, yeah. Um, I'd love to do that. I've always wanted to build my own bikes. Never really given it much more of a thought though, because I'd want to get all in. I'm quite a, an obsessive kind of person. I'm either all in or I just don't bother, not interested. So I'd just say not yet for the time being. Um, it's definitely something I've looked at. I've had interest in the past. I've had some custom frames made to my spec before. I've got titanium Linsky frame made by Ragley Bikes for me. I've got that custom intense that Jeff Steber made for me with my choice of geometry. In fact, I went over there to make it with him. That was one of the single coolest things I've ever done, getting to see him prototyping me a frame in the flesh, brilliant. Yeah, I would definitely love to work on bike design. Hmm. I think there's a video there, but actually I think there's something I'd really like to pursue down the line. So yeah, I think I would definitely be interested. Next question, how damaging is frame rub from cables? Other than cosmetic damage, should I worry about it? Kind of depends on where it is and how it's happening. If it's around the head tube of your bike, it's just gonna do cosmetic damage, like you say, so it's just gonna damage your pride, really. Um, if your bike was made out of steel, you could get corrosion here, so you do wanna protect against that. But I have seen some forms of damage from cables that you cannot come back from. I forget the brand of bike it was, but it had twin cable port entries on the head tube, but it was this year at the front. It was like two milled in ports. And it was on a mega lightweight bike. And I've got a feeling it was like a cross country bike with a carbon steerer tube fork. And the, the brake hose was actually rubbing on the steerer tube and it bored basically a groove in it. And can you imagine having a groove in your steerer tube with the amount of force that goes through it? Like I've never seen anything break from it, but I reckon it probably could. So keep an eye on it basically. Oh, this is a risky question. Can I drill a hole in the seat tube on my aluminium frame to root an internal dropper post? Well, yes and no, but no officially. Now, every frame manufacturer will be like, no, 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 no. And every warranty person you speak to, they'll be like, no, 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 avoid this at all costs. Yet some people will still naturally want to do this. Now, if I was ever gonna do this myself on an aluminium frame, I'd probably want the frame to already have brake um, bottle bosses on there and I'd drill out one of the bottle bosses because there's already a hole in the frame. It's just a threaded insert. So I would be inclined to drill out the insert and entry into the frame at that point. But also just on a logical form, I can't see if you drilled the hole it was small enough in the correct place, it would do that much damage. But don't listen to me. The official line is no. Okay, next question. Do bigger or heavier riders need specially built wheels to cope with the extra stress? I wouldn't say they need specially built wheels, but you definitely need to consider a few things. So, I mean, I'm 200 pounds, so I'm not especially big, but I do have a bit of an impact on wheels. Now, 29 inch wheels are okay with me, but I am quite picky. I wouldn't go for a super, super lightweight set of wheels. They'd have to be strong enough. Now, these are cross country wheels, but they've got 28 mil wide rims. So they are actually fairly substantial. Yeah, you want to have, make sure you've got a nice, strong rim on there. Deep section rim and a wide rim is going to give the whole wheel more support. The more spokes you have, the stronger the wheel can be, the more laterally stiff it can be. These are all things you need to take into consideration. The wheel isn't one thing, it's a number of things. Boost spacing is good if you can have the hub flanges far apart because you get a better bracing angle. So technically, yeah, you can pick the ideal option for a heavier rider, but there isn't really a set of wheels for heavier riders. The two fundamental things I would say though is 27 and a half inch wheels are definitely gonna be better for a much heavier rider than 29. Because if you hit something at a slight angle, you're more likely to fold, crumple, taco, whatever you wanna call it, a set of 29 inch wheels. And also, don't buy a super lightweight cross country rider if you're a big heavyweight rider. 
by an enduro spec wheel set, something that's designed to take a battery because they're going to be much stronger to start with. Okay, and the last question this week is from Rattles, and he says, how do I get rid of wrist pain when I ride? My handlebars are 800 millimeters. Would it make sense to cut them? Okay, so there are so many things that you've got to take into account with wrist pain on a bike. It's all about your cockpit position and your saddle position. Let me explain a few things. Well, firstly, you said about cutting your bars down, right? So there is no correct length bar, but if you're a taller rider, typically you're going to want a wider bar. If you're a shorter rider, you're going to want a narrow bar. If your wrists are at extreme angles, if you're like your arms are out here and your wrist is at an angle, it's naturally going to put more strain on the wrist. So that is something to take into account. Now let's look at the actual height of the handlebars and your saddle. Note on here, my saddle is fairly flat. If your saddle was at a slightly nose down angle, when you're sat on it, you're naturally going to be putting more weight on your wrists. So that can give you wrist pain. So one answer would be to tilt the nose of your saddle up very slightly. Don't go too high though, because you can get undercarriage pain. So just take that one into account. The next one is the height of your bars. If your bars are too low, you'll have more weight on your wrists. But if you have your handlebars too high, then you don't have enough weight on the front end of the bike. So that's a fine tune sort of thing to take into account there. Your handlebar grips as well. The thickness of your grips, are your, are your grips too thin? Are they too thick? Are you having to make too much effort to, to hold on to them? Are they made of a rubber that's too firm for you? You've got to take all those things to account. They should be comfortable at all times and you shouldn't be able to have a nice relaxed grip on there. And then the final thing, other than the width of your bars, which we've already discussed, is the angle of your brake levers. Now, if I just sit on here and I'll show you this. Technically, when you're sat in the saddle, your brake lever should follow in line with your arm. That should be the sort of the correct angle, but this doesn't always work on mountain biking. With cross country it will, because you'll spend a lot of time out the saddle charging quite hard. So the brake lever's in a good position. But as soon as your saddle's down and you're hanging off the back of the bike, you're reaching for your brake levers more. So actually bringing your brake levers up gives you more control and it puts your wrist in a stronger position. So they're all things that you really need to take into account together, really. Now, I'm gonna throw a link to a video I made all about mastering the cockpit position and also another one about saddle position. You should watch them both because they, it's all interlinked and all has a direct effect on how comfortable you are on your bike. Watch the video, get back to us in the comments and see if it's worked things out, but hopefully it has. Now, good luck and get those questions in for next time. See you later.